Welcome back, everyone. I'm the host of the SAS Buyers Club, Omid. And I'm Joe, your co-host. And I'm Wes, author of the best-selling book, Product-Led Growth. Fantastic. Thanks for joining us this week, Wes. Uh, stoked to have you on the show. And why don't we just start by having you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, no, for sure. So I've been in the B2B SaaS space for over eight years now. I kind of got my uh, start in it doing demand generation, digital marketing for a lot of sales-led B2B software companies. I was spending hundreds of thousands of dollars promoting white papers and guides. <laughs> so you might have downloaded one of mine. And then when I was working at this company called Vidyard, we launched a free trial and then a freemium model. Free trial bombed, freemium took off. And since then, I've been hooked on this whole concept of product-led growth and like how can you actually use the product to build the business. And so um, that's really like why I'm here and why I'm super passionate about this topic. Because ever since then, whenever we got like our first users signing up, using the product, upgrading on their own without talking to them, I was like, this is the way <laughs> of the future. <laughs> this is how I buy personally. And uh, it's just nice when I could finally see it, believe it for myself with another company. And then I've been doing that ever since. Awesome. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. So how do you work with, how do you typically work with companies? Do you like help them implement product led models? So, and you, you have a company called product led, right? Or, and there's a book. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, no, for sure. So over the last like eight years, I've been trying a bunch of different models as far as finding like what actually provides the most value. Because um, when I first got into this whole product led growth thing, I was kind of naive <laughs> in the sense that I thought it was just a free trial and like good onboarding. Like that was all there was to it. Mm -hmm. uh, turns out that's actually just two out of like nine of the main components of like, how do you actually become and build a product led business? So it's really like over those eight years, I basically got like one component each year <laughs> as far as all the other things that go into building a successful product led business. So um, how we actually help companies is we, integrate being product led at the company level. So we what that means is basically we start with your vision, your strategy, how does that kind of interact? How does that change if you're actually going to go down this path? Uh, so a lot of founders actually we, we help uh, them actually sometimes decide actually it's not the right fit because like your vision is like going up market and enterprise and like it, it's it's not this <laughs> if mm. your vision's like we want our product to be accessible we want tons of people to be able to use it um, and have like an amazing great experience it's like yeah okay we're vibing it might be the product led path for you and, <laughs> and so yeah. that's kind of the first component I don't know if you want me to go through like the other eight but. Um, I truly believe like integrating it at the company level is what actually makes it stick. Uh, if you just slap on a free trial, a lot of the times they just treat it just like a, a demo request where it's like, okay, let's move them on to like convert these free trials. Um, and it doesn't usually work at that level. Got it. So I hear that the first kind of component of product led growth and the acronym for product led growth, if you don't know, is PLG. So def we're going to define that acronym yes. up front. And so if we refer to PLG, we're referring to product led growth. But um, so it sounds like the first component is um, can't it's not for enterprise. It's for, you know, kind of direct to consumer. Is that right? So a lot of times a product like companies start off best serving the small and medium sized businesses. Does that mean they cannot move up to enterprise deals later on? Absolutely not. Like they can actually bridge the gap eventually. Um, but a lot of the times when they start off as like a product led startup, it is usually, if it's successful, it's usually solving the problems of the small and medium sized businesses. I could get into why, but it has a lot to do with like, there's a lot more volume at that level. And there's also a lot more beginner problems uh, for solving the same thing. So like if you pair that together, it really creates uh, the right environment for a product that company to kind of come in, provide something maybe that's even dumbed down versus what's being served to the enterprise customers. But it gets the job done just good enough for those users. So it kind of creates a vacuum where you can really win in the small, medium sized business with a product and model. And so um, this, for these B, B2B businesses, talk to us a little bit about these like small to medium sized businesses that they might be serving that, you know, PLG might be better for. Yeah. So like we get a ton of these uh, clients where they're like, they have the SaaS for like, just name the 
specific type of profession. So we felt like vertical to... SaaS pretty much. Oh yeah. Like yeah. vertical SaaS is super common. It absolutely works for horizontal SaaS too. Um, and it's like some of the most successful ones like Canva or ClickUp, like all these ones, they're, they're all horizontal apps, but, um, yeah, <laughs> the ones we end up helping a lot more are the vertical ones. Um, I don't know why there's just more of them. So yeah, for your question, like, how do we help them? Is that where you wanted to dig in or no? Yeah. would love that. Okay. Yeah. So when it comes to like how they serve their customers, the main kind of big thing we do is just get super clarity on like that second component, which is who is that ideal user? So typically it's like uh, a lot of these companies that are like, oh, we have like three or five kind of ideal user profiles or like ideal customer profiles. And actually let me distinct or like put in a little different thought here. Um, in a sales ad company, your ICP or ideal customer profile is like the holy grail. It's like focus on that person. When it comes to a product-led business, it's actually a bit different. I call it like, what is your ideal user profile? Because the big distinction here, and it's a really important one, is when you're going product-led, you are creating an experience for that user to win. And when you're going sales-led and you're just focusing on the buyers, uh, that ideal buyer profile is, is different. It's usually like that VP or it's a CEO or it's somebody who's at the top who has that decision-making authority. But the user is usually the person using the product <laughs> and it's not always that VP most often it's not uh, so that's actually a really important thing to really kind of dial in for these product -like companies because you are building the product and experience for these people you told a story um in your intro in terms of how you had your like um you know uh, come to Jesus moment with yeah. PLG pretty much is <laughs> like kind of like what I heard is um it and it kind of and correct me if i'm wrong but plg is kind of seen as like the new wave as compared to like the freemium model is that is that right like freemium model is kind of like on its way out plg is on its way in is that is that the case and if so um how was it that because i heard that freemium was oh go ahead joe were you gonna say something i'll say or is it part of it but go on yeah yeah, I heard in your story, it was like you experienced something related to freemium and then yeah. realized product led was the way. Can you speak to that? Yeah, no, for sure. So um, at the beginning, I, I kind of mentioned there's like those two things I thought product led growth was. I thought it was just like your model, which was like free trial, freemium model. Um, and then it was like great onboarding. I thought it was like, that's that's all there is really to it. Um, so the third thing like we focus on there is like first is like a vision strategy. Second is really going through like who's your ideal user. The third thing is like, what is the right model? Um, so freemium is is product led in a lot of ways, but like how do you operationalize it? I've seen a lot of freemium models where uh, you sign up, no guidance whatsoever, and you try and upgrade. And it's like talk to sales or you're just getting hounded anyways <laughs> through email. and I don't call that product led, although it's a freemium model or it's a free trial model. Um, there's one I signed up for yesterday. It was like request a free trial. And it was literally just, uh, there's probably a cheaper way, honestly, for them to get people in the door because a lot of people are resistant to demos. So <laughs> um, the model is like that third PC you really have to craft. And the way to craft it is really around who is your ideal user profile? What is like a meaningful milestone that they could accomplish for free? in that product. A great example, like Canva, since a lot of people know Canva, it's like, okay, can you create a design? Yeah, you can totally create a design for free. You can create as many designs as you want, but as soon as you want, you know, uh, company branding or you want some like, you know, next level feature or some custom assets, um, it's gonna charge you. So that's like the bubbling up of like the beginner stuff, free. Great. You have everything you need to succeed. The intermediate stuff is like, that's where the first paywall is. I um, mean, then advanced, of course, like to your point of like, can you move up to enterprise? Of course, you can solve more advanced problems later on. Uh, but that's typically like a super high level of like how you can structure your model um, that I think even in that first example I shared with you, I didn't get. We at Vidyar just launched a free trial that it was like, hey, do it yourself. Um, and to be honest, it wasn't that hard to get to value. Like people just had to upload a video. Um, they had to put it on their website and then they had to direct marketing traffic to it. 
integrate it with the marketing automation platform. And then they can see who exactly like, Joe, are you watching my video? Wow, that's cool. So like, it wasn't crazy, but it was still too much. <laughs> so most people didn't even bother or get to value. So it just didn't work. Um, mm. So yeah, that's kind of the, the last point there. If you don't get people to value, um, the whole product led model just falls on its back. Gotcha. So value is incredibly important in the product led model is what I'm hearing. Is there a difference between freemium and product led? Why is one called freemium and one called product led? So like the model is a component of being product led. Uh, so it's not like one or the other. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's kind of like the shell of like, what do you give away for free? Um, a lot of product led models will have a freemium model. So uh, it's not necessarily a separate entity, but the reason why I have that distinction of like uh, product led business is because that to me in my kind of like how I break it down is really the entire business that's operationalizing this strategy uh, versus just like, oh, we, we got this model. <laughs> it works well kind of thing. Oh yeah, I was gonna let you respond, but yeah, I hear you loud and clear on that. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to do a quick question and we can edit this out. We had talked about how we were going to bring this over to exits. Now, one thing we like to do is really talk a lot about you and what you're doing and the service you're offering and stuff. And this question will be for you, Omid, I guess, for, for, the, for the first part of it is how do you feel? I think I kind of want to ask more about what Wes is doing before we move on. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. Um, and so I'll go ahead. Okay. Now we're kind of just back in character or whatever we call it. Um, so you, with what you're working on now, then who's your main uh, typical target demographic within SAS or is it all SAS generally? Yeah. So it's pretty specific. It's the CEO of a B2B SaaS business. That's usually between like six figures and seven figures. So the reason we focus a lot there is because we've, we've helped companies in all the spectrum. Like we've helped billion dollar companies like implement product led growth, but we found if it's installed at the early stage of building like your first go to market motion, it's way more successful. It's way stickier uh, because you're building like a product of business from the ground up versus like tearing apart like the sales on motion. We've had companies where they're even just at like two mil, they got like 40 people, venture back company. And it's like, listen, like the product led version of you, uh, there's, there's a way to get to like four mil with three people. And <laughs> it's just like the only difference between you and that sales like company is a lot more leverage. And I think when it comes to, uh, like the buying side of it, a product led business is way more sexy in a lot of cases than sales led business in some cases, because it has way more built in leverage. Your product, uh, has a better value prop. Just face it. Like if you have a website, same copy, everything else, nothing else other than like sign up for free versus sign up for a demo, you'll get a lot more people into that, usually 20 to 30%. So like a product company will just have a better conversion rate. Then when it comes to like getting into the product of onboarding people, it's like your product is actually doing the majority of the onboarding. So like your support costs, customer success costs are way less. Uh, and then when it comes to upgrading, if you do the metrics right and you charge like value-based metrics, uh, you're naturally going to land and expand. So you might start off with small payments, but then as they add more users or as they hit more usage out of your product, it just naturally grows. So uh, that's why I'm super bullish, even when it comes to like acquisitions and buying part of their companies. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And in specific, I'm hearing two real key things that are important to call out here. One is that sure uh a product -led, led growth business is just more let's say palatable for a buyer yeah it's just going to be something that itself sure on the financials and the operations going to be different on paper but just generally it's also a stronger starting point and you already have a lot that's been invested into the business up front but as opposed to just kind of as opposed to seeing that as a different business it can be looked at as a more evolved business or something that more investment has been made into. So yeah. from a buy side, I definitely see that as being a, a key function or uh, element of looking at the company. A lot of people do have a lot of different opinions about how the company should have its, have it structured. You know, you hear a lot of different things like sales led, 
and you also hear what, what, what was another one that was oh gosh i'm blanking it there was another one too that i was just talking with omid about the other day when we were talking about product -led group growth and so there's there's definitely different ways people that uh, people look at it and so having an emphasis on the value of product -led growth for a buyer makes a whole a heck of a lot of sense now the second point i wanted to say there was it was really interesting how you mentioned that uh, for, uh that you also work with you know larger companies so and for me the thing that's really interesting there is that you know when if you're looking at buying a business that isn't already plg enabled then that's a great opportunity as part of the acquisition process or analysis of, of what you're going to get out of the business uh a part of that is okay how can i enter uh, implement plg as part of my forward-looking growth model and how can i get a hold of an expert such as wes to help guide me along in that process at first i had a question actually earlier in the call which was okay are you guys only working with startups and so i hear now that that's not the case and you guys work with large businesses and that this makes a lot of sense probably depending on a case-by-case -case analysis this makes a lot of sense for even grown businesses. And maybe even if, if somebody's releasing a new brand and it's a grown business and starting that out from the get go or, or you're buying a business and you're like, oh, we can, there's a whole other product line that we can launch with the same customers. That's a good opportunity to look at PLG. So that makes a lot of sense. You know, we very often, and I'll just kind of throw out a, lot, a final comment here. We very often see clients that are buying businesses with the intent to, well, they, they basically see holes in the current marketing plan. Maybe even just, maybe the, and very often it is the case that the owner's happy with their growth. And there's just things that else, uh, other things that they could do that they haven't done yet. Maybe because they require a lot of effort, maybe because those owners don't have the expertise yet. And so we see a lot of people, especially people with a marketing background or partner with people who are professional marketers, um, buy business with the intent of, having a growth plan that mm -hmm. includes, you know, a lot of different uh, marketing they were doing before. And I could see that as lining up perfectly along uh, PLG, that same mindset. Yeah, um, it can definitely like you can do that with like a take a sales of business, let's say, let's say you're buying it like based off of like EBITDA or something like that, like that business is gonna be a lot less profitable <laughs> if it's sales led, most likely. Um, and then you could find out a way to either like keep your costs like the same and double the revenue if you have more of the product that approach. But the one thing I'll, I'll touch on that to yeah. just kind of consider is the culture is actually very different. Like that's actually one of the reasons why we decided to focus a lot on like the six and seven figure businesses, because it's like we could install it at that level and the culture would really stick. And that would be something that if you did purchase it, let's say when it's like at five mil or 10 mil or something like that, um that business like you you wouldn't have to make as many changes to it the owner probably could exit out of that business pretty easily um and you would still have a great product in that case so yeah you could definitely do it both ways uh, but whenever it comes to sales of businesses usually the product department is pretty weak in the sense that they're more feature driven like oh we got this big customer they're you know a million dollar contract or something like that and we we got to build all these things and um it's great and all for like boosting revenue, but over time it actually adds very much so complexity to the product and getting people to that value. The reason why I mentioned at the beginning, I was like, yeah, a lot of product companies succeed focusing on those small, medium sized businesses first is because they solve those easy problems. And as sales of business, typically they make more of their money focusing on solving enterprise problems, which are more complex. So you just have a lot of inherent complexity in a sales of business, not to say you can't do it. We've done it. It's just the hit rates lower. So that's kind of what I'm looking at. I'm, I'm trying to optimize for like, how can we get to like 90, 95% success rate with each of our clients versus like maybe 20, 20% 20 for sales led to product led. Like it's, it's a lot less. So, so oh, go, oh, go ahead. I mean, yeah. So, you know, you find companies in what it sounds like are in the 10 to a hundred MRR stage. Is that yeah. right? And when they find you, what are they usually doing in terms of, you know, their user acquisition strategy? 
Yeah, so a lot of them, they have like either just one or two kind of channels that they're really focusing on. Uh, so some of them is like ads, some of them it's organic. Uh, there is, seems like a lot more companies like at that stage do find that organic works really well, especially for product led businesses, because like your customer acquisition costs are usually, you have to get them a lot less <laughs> because you're not necessarily charging as much right away for them. So uh, yeah, organic seems to still do pretty well for some of these companies. Um, at that level. And usually they have around, you know, a thousand to maybe 2000 kind of signups per month kind of deal. Yeah. Okay. Oh, go ahead, Joe. Was there a question oh, that you yeah, had? Yeah. Follow. No, go ahead. Yeah. So, okay. So I, I hear that, um, a lot of them are doing organic, for example, um, organics working for them. Organic is like, I, I think it's a really hot, uh, trend right now in terms of just making sure that, um, your business is optimized in terms of yeah. spend. Um, so, you know, we're in, in a, uh, uh, an environment where uh, capital isn't flowing the same way that it used to. And so investors are looking for um, operators and founders that can operate in lean ways. Tell, how does PLG kind of fit into that? Or, you know, I hear that they come to you, they're doing organic and you're like, oh, you could do this much better. Why don't you do it, you know, product led? So um, how do you take them from that organic space that, you know, they've been winning with and kind of tack on your product led approach? Yeah, so we don't actually focus too much on like the channels they're using. Uh, basically what we, our whole system is basically your go-to-market system. So like if you plug in high quality traffic, you're gonna print more money once we're done with it because like we have the the first kind of three components, the vision, user, model, like that's just your foundation. And then we, the second phase is really like refining like your offer, your experience, getting people to value, making it effortless to get to value and your pricing. So like that's the growth engine part where like, okay, once we get like that running, um, then we can start running a lot more experiments around like some of those new channels and figure out like what are some new ways to really um, scale this up. And also some of the channels uh, that are really common for product led companies is virality too. And thinking about, okay, like this product, um, somebody's going to share it with somebody. Maybe it's a presentation tool. It's like, great. Um, we're going to get that logo <laughs> in front of a lot of people. Right. So that could be a great growth lever as well. And that's like one of the great opportunities is you don't always have it. Um, there's yeah, like internal and then external virality. Uh, but even if it's like a collaborative tool, that's like the internal kind of virality of sharing it across like the internal team and just growing from the number of people using it. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the extent of where we focus on user acquisition, but, uh, it's just getting the foundation built so that if you get a user who signs up for free, uh, the odds of them converting to a paid customer is like, it just keeps getting higher and higher. That's the culture that you were talking about. You get people in the product led company mindset. It sounds like by helping them really understand who their client is, how to speak to them and how to move them through the funnel. So it doesn't matter where the clients are coming from. It sounds like, you know, whether it's organic, whether it's paid, whatever it is, the channel, you really get, um, you know, the founder CEO who's making, you know, 10 to a hundred K a month in the mindset of, hey, let's get you more conversions. Let's optimize your conversions by helping you exactly understand, you know, vision. I heard you talk about vision, understanding, you know, the buyer profile, so on and so forth, and then implementing, you know, this kind of whole holistic product led model. Is that accurate? No, oh, definitely accurate. And yeah, that's actually why like most people come to us. It's like not because they don't have a free model. <laughs> it's usually because like, we just launched this thing really quick and like we are having either nobody or like almost nobody sign up for the paid plan. Mm. And that's where like they, I have it on our website where it's like <laughs> product led growth is more than a free trial. And uh, it's because so many people hit that iceberg of like, oh, 
like there's so many more things to this and they start realizing oh maybe it's because our pricing is really high and like oh maybe it's because like uh we're not clear on our vision oh maybe it's because we're not clear on who this is for oh maybe it's because we totally did guess what to give away for free <laughs> so they they eventually figure out those nine components but uh it's just like you could have avoided a lot of pain um how do you just follow them in the right order kind of deal yeah, it sounds like culture is a big deal from your being able to see eye to eye with either the CEO or key staff or even just operational staff, but also to even be able to get the message across. So I could definitely see a sales led growth business like the CMO wanting to talk to you and bring you in. And then you talk to the CEO he may, who may have been a sales exec and have a completely different mindset as you come talk to you and, and just have that not see eye to eye. Have you had those type of things happen to you before? Yeah. And um, one thing that, I mean, it seems obvious once I say it, but like the CEO of a product led company is usually very product oriented, like no, no duh versus like the sales that company it's like they're usually really really good at sales uh and the marketing side of things so whenever you're thinking about like buying the company that's a really important factor because it's like what is your unique skill set that you're bringing to the table so a lot of product led founders uh, they're not focusing a ton on the marketing. They have built out, if you look at their team, their org structure, heavy on their product and development and engineering fronts, a light on the marketing. So uh, they're just obsessive about making this product amazing. So if you bring a different skill set to that table and you're the, the yin to the yang, uh, they might actually decide, hey, I want you to like, you know, join <laughs> this company and help me scale it because like, I, I am not the best at this other side of it. So um, that's just something to kind of consider based on what is your skill set. That makes a lot of sense. So I, I could see there being a, a resistance on one hand, but on the other hand, just a complete attachment of a different way of looking at things and doing things uh, in an additionally better way. Uh, Omid, I'll throw it over to you. I have a, I have a question formulating in my head, but why don't you okay, cool. Let it, let me know when uh, that question ripens for you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, just do give me one second though, because I thought my uh, computer charger was over here, but um, it's. Oh not. yeah, just take a quick second. I mean, yeah, I just need to grab my computer charger and call oh, it back over. That's the next question. I, what I wanted to ask about, but I was hesitant to do so, and so I was still thinking it over. Was and again, a little aside. It was one of our goals is doing the podcast is having no asides and like have it all be like Joe Rogan, you know, where it's just talking. Yeah. We haven't, we haven't gotten to that stage yet because we're still kind of doing this. We're still like, Hey, by the way, so I was going to ask was, does it make sense to, to ask you about, or, or do you have any stories to talk about your experience with founders at the time of sale or at the time of purchase of a business? Yeah, so usually I'm before that. So a lot okay. of founders will come to us and be like, you know what? Um, like our business is like low crew, free to paid. Uh, things are all over the place. Like we don't have that scalable system yet. So yeah. like we're the people who come in basically like maybe two or three years out before they actually like decide to scale. Like we just signed up a client exactly like this is his goal in like a uh -huh. year or two. He's like, I want to exit this business, go into like that board observer kind of role. And I, I want to just make this kind of scalable system work. So like we can basically keep the same amount of people or we can actually get let go of some, have a more lean team uh, printing profit and really kind of get this ready to exit. So yeah, the product led path can do that a lot faster than like, we just need to hire like, you know, twice the number of salespeople, I hit our goal for EBITDA and like then we're good kind of thing. No, that, that makes a, a, a lot of sense. Um, well, I mean, you're back here. So let me continue my quick aside actually though. You know, I hear that, but on the other hand, like maybe we can talk more about but we talked generally about the advantages of PLG companies for that ultimate exit and how it's a now how it's built it's a building up process to just creating that value. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could talk more about very specific details then. Does that make a sense for you guys as a as a, a next step for the conversation? Sure. Okay. Yeah, and there's there's probably going to be there uh, things there like more acronyms or 
if you have any specific stories like, oh, this one founder had that and this happened to them at the time of exit, that was super advantageous. Just any of that type of stuff that you got there, I think makes sense. Have you yourself, uh, in a separate from that now, going a little further down the conversation, have you yourself had any experience with exits or buying a business? And it's, it's fine if not, I'm just trying to advance. Yeah, no, not yeah. at this point, no. Okay, no, that's completely fine. So what we should do is we should talk more than about the founder's journey and the creation of value like we're discussing now. Omid, does that make sense for, Omid, you, you were, you probably had thoughts too about how you want to proceed the conversation. No, uh, it sounds like you, you know, we're headed in a direction so we can just follow that trail. Okay. That sounds great. Okay. Now I'll, I'll wait for your editing. Uh, uh, <laughs> it'll be easier to see. Um, we can go ahead and get back on. So now, Wes, uh, I hear from you that, you know, okay, let me start again. So, Wes, when it comes time to buy or sell a business, uh, the founder stuff has already instituted PLG usually. Is that right? We talked about this before. Yeah, so, like, that's usually their, their ultimate goal. Like, they want to have that scalable system uh, because a lot of them, um, they basically hit, like, a growth ceiling where it's like, maybe they've done that sales led path. Like they got to like the two or three mil mark or something like that. And I just had a founder the like last week, he's like at that range, he has like 40 employees at like two mil, which is a lot. And 17 of them are in the sales capacity. So he's thinking, okay, how do I get to like the six mil range in the next two years? He wants to, you know, go that fast. And so then thinking about like, how does he get there? He's thinking about, okay, there was this path, which we've done, which is just more of the same. He's thinking, wow, like we're going to have like a hundred people uh, to get to that at the same level versus what are some of the other ways we could get more leverage as a business. And so thinking through that is really, really important because it's like, well, your product could onboard a lot of people faster uh, if you had you know, sales assist motion where like users come in, if they're bigger accounts or something like that, you can definitely have people reach out to them. Um, but that doesn't require as many sales reps it, because right now everybody goes through a demo process. It's expensive. The conversion rates are low. So yeah, that's part of like what some of these founders are thinking. Like, they're like, you know what, the system I have, it works yet <laughs> scaling is going to be like, they just look at themselves like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be hard <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah you know well, a few things that came to mind from what you just said one was that people usually come to you if they hit a plateau and earlier you said like hey maybe they just lost their product and they're like what the hell my freemium isn't working are there other people or other circumstances like where you usually find uh, a lot of people come to you from yeah, so there's the bigger enterprises that are like, wait, um, the uh -huh. like small, medium sized businesses, uh, like maybe they have a competitor that's like going after just those people and it's a product led business. They're like, those people are going to like blow us out of the water basically because mm -hmm. we can't compete at that level. Like for us to acquire a new customer, our customer acquisition costs are, let's just throw out a random number, is like $5,000 to get a new customer. And they're selling their thing for less than that. So like, there's no way we could ever go into that market realistically with our current approach. We need something that's touchless. So we need to uh, figure out like, is it a subsection of our product? Is it, um, you know, just a dumbed down version of our product? So they're thinking of like, how do we kind of stay alive and still, because like, if you attract those small, medium sized businesses and they grow into bigger businesses, that's the ultimate long term play. Um, so, yeah, if you pigeonhole yourself in enterprise, that's actually what has happened to a lot of big enterprises, where it's like the product led business has just like eaten their lunch for the next 10 years <laughs> because they're already using that platform and the product led company is just growing with them. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, you actually brought to mind there like Elon Musk selling his. AI trucks just by launching some cool videos on the internet, whereas these, whereas the Ford and the Daimlers of the world have these extremely expensive sales machines to run those forward coming, you know, large enterprise sales to logistics companies, etc. And so that that kind of 
uh, that made me think of that. It all and it made me want to ask the question about okay, well, so in the PLG model, how much of that relates to the founder and in, in, in his becoming a billboard uh, as an advocate for the product, or is it product led and it's not about the founder? Yeah, I guess in most product led companies, it's less about like that media brands. It's like, oh yeah, why I'm using Miro is because of the founder. Uh, like why am I using Notion is not because of the founder. And I think there's like very different areas where like that, that play makes a ton more sense. So like if you want to use the media play to win as a business, uh, it all comes down to what is your strategy. And it's like, is owning media and being like that personality driven brand, maybe it's like if it's another project management tool and <laughs> it's like, yeah. why the hell do I need another one? I, I, yeah. I was just seeing them as almost meshing together in, in this example I gave though, because like, you know, Elon shows that I'm not trying to be an Elon fanboy. We worked at an Elon Musk ideated business before. Ideated business, I mumbled there. Uh, before, I'm not trying to be a fanboy, but it just came to mind. And so uh, what, I, what meshed together there, though, is that, you know, he's almost synonymous with the, the quality of their products. Totally. And like, and like him talking and him being like, you know, that uber geek, internet genius guy, you know? And so him even talking about the product is so powerful and just having a very few, like on a, ver a very small online presence is so powerful to, to draw people's attention to that product in specific above and beyond any other competitors in the same market. I guess that's where I was seeing the concept of marketing and the media and the branding is yeah. me meshing together with PLG. And like, I think there is like some really great examples. Like I think um, Patrick at ProfitWell, like they did an awesome media play. And that was a big part of like how they won. Um, I was just chatting with uh, Alex who runs Groove HQ. It's like a help desk solution that's like just directly going against <laughs> like Zendesk. <laughs> and so they're, but they're like, they're bootstrapped and they're doing a great job, but it's like the media play. Like we're going to share all our stats and like how we're running our business and stuff. And so it's like, it's something you can connect with and you're like, why would I, oh yeah, I'm going to support the, like the small business, the underdog. Um, it can absolutely work, but like, I'll touch on like that vision strategy component first, because it's like, I think this is where companies run into problems when it's like, they're creating a strategy. They don't have a clear way of like, uh, one, like what is winning look like? Two, how are we going to win? And so there's only so many things you can pick. So especially if you're early stage, like let's say you're uh, around a million dollars, it's like you might get one or two like main reasons why you can win in your business. It might be because you have the, the easiest to use software. It might be like one other reason is like, maybe it's your community or something like that. Uh, but every one of these things like, oh, oh in media, uh, you can build up to having more than one way of like how you can win as a business, but uh, it's like at different levels that I think it makes sense to kind of deploy all of them. <laughs> if you yeah, know. no, I hear that a lot and hear that makes a lot of sense. And usually from my experience working with PLG guys, they're like strictly in that mindset and, and not, uh, not uh, running around in multiple areas unless they happen to have been like a marketing professional who had been around different areas over time. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. Omid, I'll throw it over to you before I keep hogging the mic. Um, what are the nine components, Wes? Yes, <laughs> digging into it. All right, so the <laughs> first one we went through is the vision strategy, you got that. Second, um, I'll go through them all because like the order is important. The second is really focus on your ideal user profiles. Like what are their biggest challenges? What does success look like for them? Third thing was, what is your product-led model? So a lot of people just like jump straight to, oh, it's free trial. Oh, it's freemium. Um, I actually argue a lot that it doesn't matter what model you use. What actually matters is what you give away and like what milestone are you actually gonna be able to enable with the right tool? So that's the third thing. Um, then the fourth is really getting into like how to build your growth engine. So like that's your free offer. So like really nailing like an irresistible free offer, that's going to boost your conversion rate like 20, 30% for sure. And then when it comes to the experience, uh, that's the fifth one where it's like, how do we make it effortless to get to value? 
uh, effortless to sign up, effortless to upgrade. And then the sixth one is really pricing. So how do you kind of scale with the growth of the customers? So as they get more value, you can charge more. And then the next three are really focused on how do you actually scale your product-led motion? So the seventh one is really about data. So do you know like some of the biggest bottlenecks in your growth engine? Where are people dropping off? Uh, where is the highest leverage opportunity? So that's really important stuff once you get that built out. And then the eighth one is really your process. So uh, you talked about like different channels and everything. So it's like, well, are you, is your team running like high impact experiments every single week? What does that look like? If you have the right data, you can find those. You can start doing them again and again. And then you're going to get to a point where you're like, we are like hitting the, the nail on the head on a lot of these experiments. We're having a ton of success. Uh, the last one is team. So where are the areas you need to really beef up? Maybe it's you found out like ads are working great. So you need to hire a head of ads. Uh, maybe it's because you realize like your onboarding is really bad. <laughs> You're like, I need to hire a growth product manager to really like level this up. And so that's kind of the, the last one is really uh, hiring as a last resort once you kind of build this scale machine. Um, and I think a lot of founders start there with the who thing first. Um, and they already have all the abilities on their team to kind of make this work. And so um, there's always the saying of like, who, not how, but like when it comes to product led, it's like, well, your product can't do a lot of things that the who could <laughs> by adding people to that, you add inherent complexity. That's not as reliable as like if your product could onboard people use that versus doing these custom onboarding calls. Why not kind of deal? Yeah. So I mean, oh, are you going to go ahead? So, go ahead, Joe. Uh, what I was going to say was, so yeah. So it sounds like if you had a checklist, of the nine things available that'd be super useful for founders and buyers. Do you have one on your website or is that part of anything you got online? Yeah, that's actually our like free products. So if you go to <laughs> 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 basically we ask you like 18 questions that scores you on each of these components. And it will tell you like, hey, like if your vision or strategy is weak, uh, start there. And then um, that's actually part of our free motion too. It's like, everything's for free. Like you can DIY this yourself. Uh, but what we found is like for our kind of like building our own version of being product led, it's like, well, if you want like a guide or support to actually implement it, um, that's where we come in and we can actually help you accelerate that and get alignment internally. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, definitely for founders or buyers who are looking at businesses, they should go check out Wes's site and get that because it even makes sense to me here now sitting here thinking, oh, okay, like I should send my clients this checklist as part of their analysis of the business when they're looking at it. Because it's even if it's not their main thing of what they're looking at when they're buying a business, or maybe it's not, maybe I already know it's clear, it would, you know, it's not gonna be part of the process at all. But for those people who are who it would be the process for potentially. It just makes sense as something else to take a gander at when you're looking at the business. A lot of people are overly emphasized on just looking at the financial metrics, maybe the churn rate, but being able to take a step back and say, okay, here's something operationally or just strategically to also analyze the target buy would be super helpful, even just as a cross reference, the reference. Because a lot of buyers there out there obviously already have their own. You know, Sorry, someone there. There is. Uh, on a pot, because there. So a lot of buyers out there already have a lot of their own ideas of what they're looking for. So that's very clear. Definitely. Yeah, like that assessment would just go mostly through like your go-to-market motion. So really focuses a lot on like, how does this business make money? Uh, and is it really efficient? And is there a lot of friction in it? And so if you do find like, let's say a part of their company where it's like, you know, they got a strong vision strategy, they know their user really well, uh, they got a, like a decent model, but like their offer and like experience is like, you know, weak or even better. Let's say like their offer is terrible, <laughs> but their onboarding is like great. It's like, oh, that's like a quick win. Um, in the first 30 days, we're probably going to be able to, um, you know, make a lot more money in this business because they they just have this bad offer uh, kind of deal. So it does give you a little bit of that flexibility of like where to triage and where to focus. 
Um, but yeah, you can totally use it for like deciding, okay, what should we focus on first when we do purchase this business or should we even bother? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. There's, I mean, it's just, it's, it is very common in the industry to be like, okay, these are the financials and the business looks like it's running well, yeah. as opposed to, okay, here's a different blueprint. Let's just look at it. Even if it's just the person's first experience thinking about things this way, it's definitely, uh, clear to me that it's worth taking a check at that. Cool. So going back to that third component, um, remind me what the third component was, Wes, the product led model. Yeah. So you had talked about as part of the product led model, there's an analysis and what becomes incredibly important is what are you giving away? Is that, is that a correct yeah. restatement yeah, of, of what you said? What do you give yeah. away? For you? Yeah. Can you walk us through that, that third component in terms of the product led model and, and what goes into, you know, the analysis of the product led model and how, what is given away becomes important? Yeah, for sure. So it all builds off of like that understanding your ideal user. And so we start off there where it's like, okay, who is this uh, that we're going to design this for? And then the kind of outcome is like, okay, what does success look like for that person? And then we can kind of dig into the model because everything's based on that. Like, okay, user success is X, let's say. Um, and then we will go through basically like these three things where it's like, okay, um, there's the beginning point and then there's the the end point for this user's journey all right so there's all these challenges in between <laughs> we list them all out of uh, like every single thing so i'll tell you like for a client who's doing like photography software we were helping them and we found out like you know what there's they had like they solved one part of this person's problem which was how to visually display the photographs like for weddings and portrait photography and like people could purchase whichever ones they wanted it looked really great for photographers but they had all these other problems before they even got to their solution so we just listed them all out like uh how to even start a business how to uh like get your first clients how to like all the things they would hit up before they even decide like oh I, I need to solve this problem where i need to like visually you know have something a bit better so we decided like where's the free line going to be where do we want to kind of decide um, that is going to be impactful for them so they decided you know what um, for us it's going to be enabling them to have like three of these galleries for free kind of like miro where it's like you know what uh, people love brainstorming and stuff but like let's not give them like thousands of them <laughs> they're going to be like using this free product forever um so yeah if finding that free line and that would give them enough like ways to test it out so that was like the free beginner milestone and we just decided okay now for that beginner milestone of like doing those three things what is that going to enable them to do uh it's going to enable them to have you know, a few conversations with their, their three clients and really blow them out of the water. It's going to give them like enough to really understand uh, what are some of the, the good features? How could they better display this stuff? Um, and then where it gets fun is the intermediate milestones where it's like, okay, now what's that next horizon? And for a lot of these photographers, it was, they want to feel like a professional. They had a lot of insecurity. They might've just started off doing this for a friend which then that friend referred them to somebody else and they got their first paying customer, but they still seriously undercharged because they didn't quite believe in themselves. But then like the next level is like the, the pro models. Like, you want to be pro. You want to get like your own brand. You want to get like all these things uh, inside. And so that's where we decided, okay, like these things are going to be part of that first pro plan. And then there's like more advanced stuff when you're really scaling your business. But um, that's how we really structure the product led model is, it all comes down to you a really great understanding of like, where is that user journey? And then where are you gonna draw that free line? And you also, when you do this, have to look at like the competition too. So let's say you're in the email marketing space, which is super competitive. I was just about to mention MailChimp and Revo. Yeah. yeah. So like, they got like 2000 subscribers, great integrations, like all these cool things and their free plan. And then it's like, well, okay, where's the free frontier? And it's sitting there. And so it's like, are you gonna be uh, 
you know, better than that? Are you going to just match it? A lot of companies, when it's a very established place, it's like even kind of players, they just try and kind of match each other <laughs> kind of deal. Um, but you got to find out where is that line and is it something worth mm -hmm. competing? But on the flip side of that, let's say you're in a blue ocean kind of place where it's like, you're the only one, you're going to be the first one with the free motion. It's like, you can start small and blow everybody out of the water because you are actually, you have the best offer in your entire market. And you know, uh, I mean, just from all the other kind of stories I've been telling regarding like 20 to 30% more conversions, imagine like every ad or whatever else you use to promote it, you're getting 20 to 30% more people than the competition. It's like, go hard, grow that business as fast as you can, because um, that's not going to last. They're going to like realize, <laughs> Hey, a lot of people are using this other person. They're doing something right. Let me analyze their funnel and uh, they'll figure it out eventually. But um, it's a great first mover's advantage. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And what I was saying there earlier was, I don't remember MailChimp's current first offer, but MailChimp's such a big company now. They have so much going for them that their prices are so sky high. But if you look at somebody like Brevo, their their product led model is so uh, it makes the, the free in the freemium uh, plan and all the features of it really give a first time user or maybe a small business everything they need mm -hmm. to be able to do email marketing. Whereas if you compare the same thing on Mailchimp, I don't remember just off the top of my head. Last time I checked was a few months ago. But they just don't offer the same set of stuff. They cut off the, the freemium in a different way, just like you're speaking to here now. And also the, the whole product is not really accessible. If you start to get into some of those other features that Brevo has, which is sent in blue and they just, just to be clear, they just renamed it. Uh, uh, why? It's kind of like Brevo. It's like where they just trying to make the name like, more brief and then the marketing team didn't have the chops to think beyond like Brevo. What is it Italian for brief or something? It's probably Latin. It's probably something like that. I don't know. It's one of those situations where it's like, did they not even try to make a name there? But I saw a company the other sorry, quick side note. I saw a company, it was called like Jack. No, Everyday Jack. And it was like a it's a it's like complete soap side. or something, right? It's it's a soap. That's supposed to be for like your everyday guy, but the marketing team's brains completely blew out at that moment. And all they had was, let's call it everyday guy. I mean, everyday Jack. I don't know. It kind of Instead of everyday Joe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> really been awesome. You really wanted it to just be everyday Joe. I uh, think that's, I that's the bitterness that. there. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but seriously, but anyway, so back to the, the email marketing, SaaS market. Yeah, I definitely see that as a good example of what you're talking about here. What we're talking I about think like to your point too, if you're thinking of like that formula that you, you kind of mentioned it, and I just wrote it down, um, where it's like, if it's a great product led model, it's like, it gives you everything you need to do X, whatever that X is for your product. But it has to do something that enables you to do something and it has to give you everything to do it. And I think where a lot of companies, even like product led ones, like sell themselves short, where it's like, oh, maybe like this part of the mindset part for a founder too is like, yeah, that scares to believe like, oh, we're gonna give away too much for free. Oh, people are gonna like downgrade and stuff like that. It's hard, <laughs> trust me, when you're trying to build a business and sustainable. Uh, but it's like, yeah, if you chins out and you don't give enough, then you're also gonna shoot yourself in the foot, give too much away for free. Um, then people are going to be like, well, I don't really have a need to upgrade. That's me and Evernote. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, oh, dude, that's hilarious. I'm at that point with Evernote. I, I don't upgrade. I haven't upgraded. Well, I used to have an upgrade years ago. I yeah. think it was because they had like a, a feature that was only for members and now they made it free or something. I think it was when they, to use mobile, you had to have premium. But now to use mobile, you don't have to have premium. I don't know. It was something like that. Uh, yeah, that's funny. Yeah. Oh gosh. I was, I just slipped it. You made me think of something else. Um, so like, so what I was thinking is, yeah, with Bravo, uh, we, for, uh, for a business, uh, last year I was talking with some guys and we were talking about, okay, which email marketing software should be used. 
And it was the only one that actually enabled what needed to be done. Mm -hmm. It basically needed to have a certain amount of uh, basically storable contacts, whereas MailChimp's storable contacts was extremely low. But the plan there was was required that it had to be much higher. And MailChimp's first offer was like three hundred dollars to do it. And so that, that gives me an example of that. It also leads me to something else: is that people can bundle together some open source software and potentially do the same. I mean, depending on how savvy the customers are, or how unique your product is, and who your target customer is, people can offer a freemium version of your product that does everything they need. And if you're trying to, if you're trying to also sell a product with upselling, but you're not giving enough features to them, you definitely get a whole, uh, lose a whole heck of a lot of customers. And it's also that way in the email marketing space, there's a lot of open source options that have a lot of features. Sure, the different ones require varying skill to implement, but even large enterprises can implement open source. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not like tech founder only, like for setting up a stack, even though it's not, yeah, it's not easy. Totally. Yeah, there, there's lots of challenges for sure with open source too. Um, but a lot of times those enterprises, like they want to pay uh, more for like security or something like that. That's like a bit more like updates and, and stuff like that too. So um, I think the only other thing I was thinking about with the like email marketing example and even Evernote that we talked about, it's like if you really focus on like one ideal user, which you should as like a product like company, you're always going to attract non-ideal users. That's just part of the game. And so like I was talking with the founder uh, earlier today, he's like, you know what? We have this time tracking software. We're planning on doing like uh, giving away five free accounts because like our ideal user uh, is on a team of like 10 to 50 people. So like, you know what? It's like going to give them enough to get like maybe their first team on board and then they can upgrade to the rest of the team. But like if you're a freelancer, you're like, great. <laughs> this thing is all I need. And I'm never going to upgrade using this software. So it's like, that's fine, actually, in a lot of ways. And those people can definitely refer you to other people who are actually going to be in your ideal user profile. And you can actually incentivize some of these non-ideal users through like referral programs and everything else. The only thing you really have to consider is, what is going to be the cost of really serving some of those non-ideal users? Because if you, let's say, go with the freemium model, give it away for free, like you're going to have a lot of people eventually using it uh, if it's done well. And so it's like, how do you reduce support costs? How do you uh, do a lot of these things? Because you definitely don't want to spend like a ton of time helping <laughs> your non-ideal users who have no intention of ever upgrading. Uh, but yeah, that's just one of the, the risks. But I think it can definitely be churned into a plus if done right, for sure. What are some primary objections that um, founders have to instituting a PLG model? Yeah, so like a lot of them are just not sure like what to do. Uh, like, I mean, that's the, not the biggest one, but the other thing is like the, <laughs> the cost of like actually doing it right. I think it's one of the things like a lot of founders are eager beavers in that sense of like, they just want to like launch it yesterday and I get it. <laughs> I'm the same. I'm like, oh yeah, let's like go fast. Um, but I think like, that's one of the things where they realize there's like, oh, there's, there's more to it. Uh, so yeah, usually our majority of our clients are like the ones who already hit the iceberg. They're like, wow, this sucks. <laughs> I thought product led growth was great. And then here I am sitting with like, you know, getting a lot of users and none of them are upgrading like this. Who the hell sold me this story? <laughs> like, what is this? Uh, so yeah, the, there's <laughs> lots of different objections regarding like the best way of how to do it and whatnot. That makes sense. But I also hear you on just like people not being sure what to do if it's entirely new to them. But that's like really where you come in, though, is like, yeah, actually, process. Yeah, you made me think of the the other kind of main one, I would say, is like, um, really just should we be product led even? Because they look at the fact of like, you know what, there's a lot of different ways to make money as a business. We could, um, I was talking to one other founder who has like a job board solution. And so, um, I was like, Hey, like he joined like our, our program and everything else like that. And I was like, okay, we got to get like clear on like your vision. And he's like, yeah, you know what? I just kind of want to, you know, uh, make money for this business. And, um, 
I, I don't really have like great ambitions for like scale or anything like that. I just want to like travel and, and make this like, you know, work for me for my lifestyle. And I was like, great. Okay. But like the way he was going about it was just more of the kind of sales led going up the enterprise path. I'm like, kudos to you. Like, this isn't the fit. Um, that's not for you. And then there's other companies where they're like, you know what? Uh, we want to like dominate our space. We want to make the, the best product possible and make it accessible to as many people as possible. And it's like, you, the amount of ways to get there, it, it has to be this way. <laughs> it's at least to like make the economies of scale work because basically what uh, I think product-led companies can do best at is really dominate a specific category uh, if done well. So that requires you to have the best product, best price, which is really hard to kind of compete at that level. So you can have a product-led company and just be a small company too. But um, I think if you've got great ambitions for your software company, it's uh, one of the best ways to scale for sure. And what are some myths about product-led growth? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, it's just a free trial. That's <laughs> a big one. <laughs> <laughs> and like, what would you say to those people? Well, like you've already said it actually. It's not just that. It's like a whole culture and a mindset and yeah, it's those just try components. It. <laughs> 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 see for yourself there's a yeah why wouldn't it. people want to dominate the space i guess like if you're a founder who's like oh i just want a lifestyle business like and that's yeah. it you know oh, i, I like not growing i like hitting a ceiling in my business you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I, I met like lots of great people too where it's like that's their goal they they just want to travel and they want to like have a business that um, they don't want to do sales calls and they're just kind of like, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm okay. Saying I don't know, resume. man. Most of the founders that I find, like all of them have like great ambitions, you know, <laughs> like I find more often than not, most founders who have started some sort of technology company has some sort of like really grand ambition. That's like what I've found in the journey is like, yeah where I'm like, whoa, this, you know, this person really actually, I've never, I've never encountered a founder that's like, I mean, we've had a few on the show that are like, you know, that their whys very much are, as you mentioned, I just want to travel, so on and so forth. But even those people, like oftentimes they have some sort of grand vision. You know, we had one guest who was like, yeah, I'm just gonna, you know, keep launching like 10 products, you know, a year and selling them off bit by bit you know, for small acquisition amounts. And that's, you know, the volume is what's going to get me yeah, you to, truly to like my grand goal. Yeah, you truly have to be ambitious though, like to be an entrepreneur to start your own business though. Like otherwise you'd be like satisfied with your desk job, which like I always like wanted to fall asleep when I was working at big companies. Yeah, saying. there's like some inherent constant dissatisfaction that like drives entrepreneurialism i think <clears throat> wes did you tell us like the actual story of how you became a champion of plg like did you tell us like you were working on this startup and you know this is what happened have we heard that story no nah, i kind of gave you the coles notes version i just yeah you gave that. i feel like i was kind of shorted on the story <laughs> a little bit yeah. i never know like how deep to go because like i have my own podcast i'm like I don't know. It's like, do you go deep or do you go shallow? No, man, we <laughs> go deep go here, bro. <laughs> we go deep here. Cool. Yeah. So, um, here's the like the, I guess the whole story. So, yeah, after Vidyard, um, I started doing consulting for uh, actually. If you want the full full story, I started. <laughs> I got into this accelerator for like my own company. It was like an SEO A/B testing product, and. Uh, you know what, like I just was doing the market research and all that stuff. And I was like, I really don't love these people. <laughs> and I think that's like one of the biggest things like starting any business is like, you have to love who you're serving. You have to love the problem you're solving. Like I'm just listening to um, Elon Musk's new book. And I was like, man, like this guy loves solving like these complex problems. It was like, I think that's a really important thing. And I, I've heard it again and again. It's like, find the problem you actually love solving and get really, really good at that. So um, yeah, that's kind of I think like, I know who said that. Oh yeah? Who? I think I know who said that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like you mean in person or you know no name? we're both a part of a mastermind oh. and yeah is it not dan martell that said that wes 
the problem find a problem you love and get really no. good at solving it dan doesn't say that i feel like he says that man probably would be something but no um not that i know of probably all right never mind <laughs> scratch that <laughs> edit that part Rob, out steve okay just remind me steve jobs did say that you have something about you have to love it or something i like used to read way too many like steve jobs quotes a long time when i was younger <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I think like after the, um, yeah, that SEO AP testing product, like it, I was just getting like some of these consulting requests and they're like, Hey, like I knew you worked at Vidyard. You wanted to like, uh, help us with like growth marketing and kind of help us do demand gen and stuff. I was like, sure. This other company thing isn't really making much money if anything. Uh, so let me, yeah, absolutely go down that path. And over like, you know, the first like six months, I was like, okay, I got to like 10, 15 K a month. And I was like, what if I like actually tried like at this whole consulting thing? Wouldn't that be like interesting? <laughs> because my current company isn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was just like, all right, like let's, I got to tell my like um, uh, coaches and like accelerator, I'm like, I'm kind of going a different way, but thanks for the grant. Um, <laughs> which was like <laughs> tough, honestly. It wasn't an easy decision. And so I started going down the consulting route. And a lot of the companies I was always helping were like these product led companies. Um, and I was always in charge of like getting them traffic. So, like getting them leads, people signing up for the free offers. Um, but then I was always like, well, what, what goes on in that product? Um, and a lot of them were like, well, I don't know, we don't have like product analytics or anything else like that set up. And so I was like, well, like, let me look under the hood. I'm curious, like, am I actually providing any value to you <laughs> with these leads? Um, are they going to convert or whatnot? And so when I started looking at that, I was like, wow, this is like a dumpster fire. And a lot of these companies, like they were just um not even going into the product a lot of them had like verify your email kind of step as part of the sign up flow and they were just like basically bleeding people out of their their funnel <laughs> with some of these steps and what i found is on average like 40 to 60 percent of people who would sign up would either never go into the product or never come back a second time and so there was like this like bloodbath. I was like, that honestly seems like a bigger problem than getting you traffic. How about we solve the big, big leak in your funnel uh, and start there? And so what I started doing is just like, I had this theory. I'm like, if they get the value, uh, odds are they're going to want to convert and use this product more. And so I just applied like standard conversion rate optimization to like, how can I like make it super easy for you to get to that value moment? And it started working. I was like, oh, wow, like these companies are seeing a lot of success. They're growing a lot faster. Uh, and then about three years into that, there was uh, OpenView coined the term product that grows. I was like, oh, like that's that's what I've been doing. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and um, OpenView has always been like a great part of me, partner on a lot of things, but like they never really had the how of like behind, how do you do product led growth? And that was always like, that's my jam. That's what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. uh, not just at video, but all these other companies I had, like, I think the one thing that you gain as a consultant is pattern recognition way faster. And like, that's actually one of my core strengths. And I was like, I can totally see the patterns faster than anybody else. I'm in the position to kind of capitalize on that. And so, yeah, I wrote the book. We had the summits on product led growth and we got the podcast and we just kind of built more of a kind of a media company initially around product led growth. And then now it's like, okay, what are some other ways we can monetize them? And then it's like, no, we need the methodology, which is kind of the second stage we're at now, which is like, how do we get really, really great at solving this problem of like, how do we scale product led companies? Uh, because our later term goal is like, we definitely want to build more of a portfolio of product led companies and advise and take minority stakes in some of these companies. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the, the goal is like get our system. So it's like 95% success rate and, and start doubling down on these companies. Mm, interesting. Talk more about that second stage where you're going to, where you're interested in, in acquiring stakes and in, in portfolio companies. Like what, where are you, what, what's, where are you now? What's standing in the way of being there? And what does that look like for you? Yeah. So we kind of made this strategic pivot about, 
um, and it's been about six months now. So it's still like, we're, we're kind of at the stage before that, where it's like build the methodology, build the kind of like volume of like CEOs and founders that we're going to be in touch with. Because like one of the hardest things when it comes to uh, like acquiring any company is like, you want to understand uh, like, how do these people work? Are they reliable? Are they getting good results? And all those things. And like a coaching program is actually one of the few ways I think you could ever get paid to build deal flow. And when I kind of work with some of these companies, it's like, I know who are the people I would actually love to partner with. And I already know, like out of the people in the coaching program, I'm like, there's some people, they show up every single week, they implement things like crazy and they are just like the killers. <laughs> like I wanna, I wanna work with those people, they're hardcore um, and they're gonna get stuff done. They just need a guide to kind of help them to get the results faster. So um, that's really the goal is like get the program to kind of get that ability of like some of these founders to 2x their self-serve revenue in that 12 month period. And then, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll help partner with them further beyond that. And what, and beyond that being like, continue to scale exit, what is, what is, it depends like on what the founder's goals are for sure. So like, that's where we'd have that conversation of like, okay, we want to partner with you. We'll take a minority stake, um, in your business to help you kind of either two X again, uh, for your business, but that's where it is really largely dependent on like, what is the founder's goal? Is this to, you know, work, you know, half as much, but make twice as much? <laughs> is this to uh, truly exit the company in like the next like three years? Is this to really just, you know, be a cash cow kind of like investment for you where it's like you can go on the board uh, and collect your payment? <laughs> I mean, there's there's endless kind of like ideal exits. And I think that's the, the hard thing when it comes to like standardization of some of these things uh, is like every founder has a different goal as far as like what is success for them. Yeah, that's something we talk about pretty frequently. Um, it's just kind of like, what what's the words we use for? There was like the sell box or, and then there was the another sweet one. spot, the exit sweet, sweet spot. spot. Um, but it's kind of all about like envisioning, okay, what is the actual future of this business look like? As opposed to where a lot of people are at where they're like, they just kind of have the business vision of the growth of the business. And then there's their life and they're kind of on the trajectory together. Mm -hmm. but you know, that's life isn't forever, you know, and also people want to do stuff outside of just the one business they may be working on, even if it's five, 10, 15 years later. And so we always talk about how important it is to look at what that's going to be. And really, in fact, what most people should be doing that as part of that process, because there's a pretty standard, you know, uh, way people go about that. And there's also a pretty standard way people go about it wrong. Um, people who've held on to their business past when they should have mm -hmm. sold it, but now they don't have the energy to keep carrying it forward. That's a fiasco. Um, people who had like a good opportunity, be, uh, had like a really good offer on their table, but they weren't to, but they weren't ready to sell, or they you know just didn't understand what was happening. Because sometimes when you get an offer, you're like, yeah. I'm the big shot. I can get more of these. That's not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, so there's a lot we talk about there about sort of, I'd love to know more about how you talk with people when it's in regards to that future vision and plan that does lead up to the exit. Yeah. I mean, it's still kind of early. We haven't had like, honestly, just be transparent, like much, uh, focus on that because like the main goal right now for our business in this phase is really to build that like demand engine and just dominate like that six to seven figures if you're a product of business we want to own that space so um right. that's kind of like where we'll focus right now and build mm. like the, the i guess the demand gen muscle <laughs> if you will and build up the volume and then we're going to figure out this next stage which is like okay what is the ideal way to kind of partner with some of these companies yeah i know that makes sense that makes sense i just wanted to ask uh, we'll be, re we're releasing a, a book here within the next few months, or let's just say this quarter or next quarter. Um, that's definitely going to be, so it's illegal, obviously, because we're lawyers. So it's, it's, uh, in large part, basically SaaS founders, um, can sell their business for a significant amount. And this is how to do that. These are the things you have to plan for in advance. This is the, uh, this is the sell sweet spot. 
And so we get that out there. We'll send you over a copy because it'll, sure. it'll, 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 so that I don't sit down right here right now and spend 30 minutes talking about it, you know? <laughs> so that'll say all of our thoughts there on what that whole like planning for the exit uh, looks like. And it's kind of, again, so that's that. And, and kind of like a refrain there is, it's kind of a thing where everybody's like, oh, I want to go to the moon, but you just need to like get halfway up a small mountain. Yeah. You know, and and you have to really become a practical minded person and and really get down to earth with that type of stuff because like counting up dollars and cents and doing a sale of a business and, and all that is a very basic process. There's not much magic to it. Totally. Yeah, no. I wanna read it. <laughs> what are <laughs> okay. you guys kind of found as well? Like whenever you're talking to SaaS companies to sell, like are you the ones typically buying them or just advising them on that whole process? Yeah, most of our clients right now are buyers, but traditionally okay. before it was all the above. We'd be representing financial parties, buyers or sellers in relation to the transaction. Yeah. So we actually closed the transaction, a SaaS transaction last night. Awesome. And I emphasize the last night part because these guys were taking my soul from me. The uh, the closing <laughs> period is just becomes like this constant nag of till when you get to that last moment. Yeah. Um, and they, they are now the proud owners of a, a great SaaS product. Um, I guess for attorney client privilege, I'm just going to stop the conversation there. I yeah. Think. I think that's they a probably good... love it. They probably love it if we talk all the <clears throat> But yeah. That's oh, we're good. definitely, definitely going to talk about it. Cause yeah, that was, that was an awesome and, um, yeah. fulfilling but, process. Yeah. Well, me was really happy about it because. He's uh, close friends with and knows our client uh, longer than I have. So Mead's like, yeah. yeah. And I'm just like, Phew. like, you know, <laughs> take the, take the shirt, the suit shirt off. I don't wear suits much anymore, but take it off and walk out of the room. That's <laughs> <laughs> My job here is done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice if that works out. <laughs> yeah. um, Wes, what do you like? So I hear that you were a founder. You ran a SEO A/B testing platform that you were accepted into an accelerator. Is that right? Yeah, it didn't go that far though. So that's cool. <laughs> Did, have you started other SaaS like type businesses or anything like that, or is that the only one? Yeah, no, that was the the only one. And that was the only one. Yes. <laughs> Okay. That's and cool. when, when you started the business, like, did you, were you like, I want to sell my business or like, what was your kind of end goal? What did you want? Yeah. I just honestly want, like, it was more about like, is this going to solve like a meaningful problem? Uh, like I had done a lot of like SEO before at other companies. And I was like, this is a great channel. Uh, this is like an up and coming, like way of like how you can optimize that channel. It still is honestly like a great business opportunity, but it's just like, uh, no, my like heart was definitely not in that kind of business long term. And I think it's like as any founder, it's like you have to find something that's like worthy of like your blood, sweat, tears kind of thing to have that like stamina to like keep at it. And so, yeah, Gosh. what I'm doing now, I love. So I'm like, I, I would rather do this 100%. Mm, <laughs> what do you love tell. about it? Sorry? Uh, Joe, what were you going to say? No, I was just saying I could tell. And then Omid said, what do you love about it? Yeah, what do you love about it? Oh, yeah, what I love about it. I think it's, um, so a big part of it is, I don't know if you've read the book, um, Unique Ability. It's by uh, the guy who founded Strategic Coach. It's awesome. It kind of like goes through like uh, a really good, like long process <laughs> of like identifying like, what are you the best uh, in the world at? And like there's, there's a few specific things. And I'm like, okay, um, what am I doing today? And I'm like, it's it's all of those things. So like, I'm really playing in my uh, zone of genius, if you will. If I, that sounds like cheesy, whatever. <laughs> no, the big leap. Have you read the big leap? Um, uh, yeah, I could. No, you guys got to take it all back. <laughs> no, you guys got to take it back to the seven wise men. And they would say, know thy expertise. So yeah. I, I'm going to take the quote back a few thousand years. <laughs> <laughs> Majorizing. Yeah. But like, honestly, I think like that's what it is. Like I love writing. So I write books and like, I think that's like one of the few people who has like the most PLG books, <laughs> weird thing to own. But, um, 
Absolutely. Yeah. Then it's like the strategy side. It's like, I love doing strategy. I love playing at that level. And it's like our whole product led system. It's all strategy. It's like, that's all it is. Um, every single level is just thinking about that. And it's like, okay, I love that. It's just doing more of it. And then the third thing is like, uh, pattern recognition where it's like, okay, finding the patterns in businesses. Mm -hmm. I'm like, because I deal with volume of product that companies, I see stuff way faster. And then it feeds the writing because I'm like, I'm seeing the simplicity of stuff. And then the fourth thing is just persuading. It's like, I gotta be convincing because I'm convincing people to do something to their business <laughs> that is <laughs> completely different than what they're used to. So it's like, fuck, like it's those four things I do again and again um i can really become great at them so it's like it doesn't feel like work yet it's like i've been working 12 hours today i'm like i'm still fired up like mm, yet mm, i could yeah. use a break but <laughs> maybe just more dinner totally. <laughs> no, totally get awesome. it. i see what you love there and me and i had the same realization we worked together a long time ago and when we started working together again after a few years of doing some different projects it was kind of like, he doesn't like to do what I do because we work together in our law firm, right? Yeah. And I don't like to do what he does. And in fact, it was, so, it was so bad that it had never even once crossed my mind to start my own law firm because there's all these things that you need to do. And I, I'm used, I was worse to work to use, work to use. I was used to working for other people. You know, that's how lawyers are. You work for a law firm. You know, I don't know. And so uh, it was really big for us because Omid was like, you like to do this stuff. Omid, I think you raised it. You were like, you like to do this stuff. And I was like, yeah, of course, don't you? And Omid was like, hell no, I hate that. <laughs> I don't want to deal with that bullshit. And I was like, what? This is the fun part. What are you talking about? And so the, the kind of focusing on your expertise or your skill or what you're good at, what you like to do. Uh, which is, is something that uh, we do a lot with our own business. Yeah. And I think there's like, um, there's in this book called Good to Great, Jim Collins, he has like that headshot concept. I didn't say it in my story, but like I literally followed that headshot concept, which was like identifying where to focus. And like the first year of the business, I like, I followed the money. I was like, oh yeah, like, let's just uh, get the first six figures. Is that a chip on my shoulder? <laughs> and I was like, all right, let's, let's this figure this out. And like, what drives our economic engine? I sold a lot of things. And I was like, man, this job I created for myself sucks. Year two was like all about, hey, like, let's do something that um, I'm actually passionate about it and I enjoy. So I like got picky with like the projects I took on, the clients I started. There was like more of the product led stuff without knowing it. And then like the third kind of big column of that it's basically the uh, genius model, you would know that. <laughs> that Venn diagram, it's like, oh, the third thing is like, what could you actually be the best in the world? And it's like, it's just a constant like honing in on like those three areas. And I think like over time, you really find like that sweet spot where it's like, oh yeah, I can like dominate this area. Oh, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. I see that. <sighs> yeah, I mean, we, we, we used to do like various, like, so, uh, for example, I have to do a lot of different corporate legal work. And yeah. m and is just one little, like, buying and selling businesses, SaaS businesses, or any business, is just one part of that. And so, it's something that, again, Omid, I Omid's kind of like my spirit animal. He, like, he says a lot of really wise things to me, and I'm like, oh, that's right. And, uh... <laughs> I got that wise look, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> And so, uh, and one of those things was, you know, we did a lot of different things. And he's like, why don't we just do this one thing? And I'm like, well, there's all these things that need to be done. And all these clients need all these different yeah. things. And it's like, now nah, let's just do this one thing. And uh, it'll just be way, and it's so much simpler. Oh, my gosh. It's how you run a business. Yeah. Yeah, but that's not how big law firms run big law firms. They're that's like, true. let's do everything. Let's I mean, when you're at that scale, for sure, you can afford to do it. But actually, that's also why they tip. They end up tipping over a lot of times as well. They cl they have to close oh, yeah. sections, law firm sections, and so on and so forth. Like, um, and retention gets harder in terms of hiring and training. <clears throat> yeah. Yep. I'd like to see PLG as applied to law firms. I actually was thinking that. I was like, man, could we like apply a PLG? 
how oh. could we apply i mean i guess like the hor- <laughs> yeah. it, it's kind of similar because it's like similar to the hormozy model right hormozy's like give it all away like you know and there's almost an aspect of plg you know that feels to me like really like the way that you described the the way that some of those SaaS companies um yeah. know their clients can you guys still hear me yeah yeah you're good. Well, me, by the way, I put an earmark in. You just gave me an interesting idea when you just said that. Oh, I was doing that, by the way, Wes. Uh, I, it wasn't clear to me whether or not we had fully, or at least maybe uh, I just can't remember, whether we fully went through all nine of the things, did we? Um, yeah, at a high level, for sure. We didn't oh, no, like, I just wanted to make sure, because I wasn't counting. I just wanted to make sure, like, we didn't stop at seven. No, no, you're good. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, I hey, just I'm won't watching. stop talking until I do all nine, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I After you went through them, I was like, wait, was that nine? Because it kind of felt like more than nine. Like yeah, I wasn't really. counting at all. I was leaving it to him. Yeah. Yeah. You did it. <laughs> yeah. No, that was awesome. Um, but yeah, I mean, the level of depth of understanding that you portrayed in understanding both not only the client, but like specifically, you know, the entire kind of universe of their needs and thoughts. Um, I feel like that could be applied to any business. It doesn't necessarily have to be a SaaS business. For sure. And then in that like super deep understanding of the end user and their entire journey from start to finish, um, it's like, how much do we need to give them to keep them and move them down the funnel what is that point where you know they absolutely like have to kind of move to like a upgraded you know version of of this product and it's only through that like super deep understanding of the client and their journey that you can get there so i feel like that could Mm -hmm. definitely be applied you know to a significant extent to a law firm in that when you put together the whole journey of the client from start to finish in terms of all of the things that they're thinking about and giving them a whole bunch of free resources, you know, in the beginning stages and up to the stage where they need to hire you, you know, with potentially some templates or something. Um, you know, we definitely see people get like way over. The only thing is for us is like, we, we do see people like actually trying to sometimes do it themselves and it can be a bit, a bit concerning. Um, and you know that that's something that we see a lot more for first-time acquisition entrepreneurs than seasoned, um, like private equity buyers. Obviously, like private yeah. seasoned private equity buyers, like know like that you should have an attorney, and they're gonna know their lane and where they should focus, and so on and so forth. Um, and that's really where they focus all of their efforts in terms of just making mm-hmm. sure that. Um, yeah. yeah, I can give you an example, like how to to kind of make it work if you want. Uh, sure. for like your specific business. So um, you're, you're absolutely right. Like it can work <laughs> across any business. Like I'm applying it to my own business. Uh, but like this whole product that growth thing is nothing new. Like this has been around like hundreds, thousands of years. Uh, it's, it's just like becoming easier for software companies. So we want to call it something new. So we now have a way of describing it because freemium wasn't quite enough <laughs> as you kind of alluded to, it was just like, that's just the model piece. Uh, there's more to it as well. Uh, so yeah, uh, absolutely. Like I believe a ton of businesses, like any business could really like find a form of or way of kind of making it work. Uh, but like for your business, what I would kind of bring it down to is like, okay, get clear on like, who is your ideal kind of like person? Is that PE? Is it like uh, someone who's like their first time buyer? Okay. Um, then like, if you find that person, like, who is that? Maybe that's good for your audience to know. <laughs> yeah, PE, P, uh, SaaS founders and then PE buyers. Okay, cool. So you got like- the So you could talk about SaaS founders, I guess, in this hypothetical. Okay. Uh, which one do you need more of? No, we do both. It's we don't need uh we don't need yeah, both. we would love more PE buyers though. Those are like definitely the people that right. we want yeah, to work with money. more. Yeah, yeah, that's we we're we yeah, we what we would like more of that. Cool. All right, so let's yeah. pick the PEs. Uh so for them, it's like okay, what are some of their big like beginner problems that we need uh to solve? So like uh I don't know your market that well, but like 
there's a lot of free things you could offer them that are really specific to like buying SaaS companies, like the B2B SaaS checklist of buying like a sales of business, the B2B SaaS checklist to buying like a product led business. Um, I mean, start taking notes quickly. Yeah. Like the <laughs> audit it's, list. It's the recording. So we got this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like all of the things to like successfully audit, go through the, like the due diligence on like a B2B SaaS company. Uh, if it's their first one, they're actually purchasing like all the things, like the biggest myths, like you're asking me some of these same questions, like, absolutely. Like you'd want to know that. Um, so it could be like heavily content oriented. Um, then I, on your website, it could literally just be like your main conversion tool could be like, okay, we're going to do like a free, uh, assessment on one of the B2B SaaS companies you've selected. Uh, maybe part of the earlier B2B uh, or a beginner problem would be like, uh, how to source your first 10 deals or B2B SaaS companies. And like of that, we're going to help you identify which one to potentially invest in and what to look for. That's going to be on the call. We're going to help you get that client ready. Um, and then like how to approach it. We're going to give you kind of like all the steps you can. So like you basically just increase their odds of success when it comes to acquiring a B2B SaaS company. So that's kind of like high level how you could like potentially think about it. There's a lot, you know, your, your audience better than I do, but um, those are some things that you can makes, kind of think about. That makes a lot of sense. And you definitely made me feel dumb there for a minute. Cause when you started talking about it, I was like, man, I know how these clients work. I yeah. was like, I know how to talk to these clients. I was like, come on, Wes. But then when you started telling me your professional audit, I was like, like, yeah, but like it all comes down to like that user understanding. It's like, okay, what is success for these people? They want to acquire like a really uh, great B2B SaaS company that's easy to run. It's super profitable. It's like plug and play uh, as far as like it's got a great growth potential in the future. And I was like, okay, great. What are all the challenges before that? Um, where's our free line? Your free line's probably going to end up somewhere like, okay, we're going to help you assess like the right one. Uh, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> and then it's like everything after that, it's like when it gets into the terms and the deal structure, all those things, it's like, that's, that's where you pay. And it makes a ton of sense, but like, we're going to be the most helpful attorney you're ever going to deal with before then. Um, and you're absolutely going to love working with us because it's like, we actually understand your problems way better than you do. Um, and you're going to probably be listening to us and thinking, wow, I didn't know that that probably would have cost me like another hundred grand or all the millions of dollars potentially, uh, just because my ignorance and like, that's where you're going to be their best friends. <laughs> yeah. You know, in fact, uh, I, I haven't seen it though. I haven't done a check specifically on this. I think I might have a few months ago, but I don't think there's a lot of like, legal m a content out there like he's talking about just for sas like sas dd checklist i don't think there's any no <clears throat> there isn't i like that no. just a lot of space for us oh that's and, really and, cool uh we're definitely gonna do that <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> i'm curious i'm not i'm not joking uh we were already doing like you know content stuff so uh uh, anyways, that's really cool. Thank you for those helpful pointers. Uh, we'll definitely, you know, right now uh, we're in the middle of doing a lot of different things like this podcast. Uh, yeah. when, we get some, when we get some more time uh, available, like basically finishing off current action items and stuff, we should definitely go, oh, me, we should definitely go talk with Wes some more about that subject. I think that'd be super helpful. Yeah, no, for sure. I'd love to uh, pick your brains on like the the next phase. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah. Um, I hear that. I hear I hear good alignment. You know, yeah. on on phase two for you as you as you move. Yeah, to more thinking about how to greater leverage this audience that you're building and the way that you help them in terms of really helping them achieve their end goals specifically totally. exits do you love exits like it is an exit something that you like want or is it something that like you're like eh, i don't you know it, what, are, you what are your thoughts your like? yeah um, well i guess yeah. if they want it then you want it for them you know that's yeah i think like it depends on like their business i think totally <laughs> um <laughs> there's like different ways of looking at it like i know for myself i'm like my ideal exit is more like um for this like coaching business or whatever it's like i it's like having a very profitable business and being the board and like that's ideal for me uh, but what's ideal for me is definitely not necessarily what's ideal for somebody else so it's mm -hmm. like if you want to exit in the next like two years i'm going to help you build a scalable system to get there um but 
yeah, it's just a faster liquidation if you take equity as the advisor or whatnot. So. Totally. But are you finding like of the founders that you have conversations with, like just curious, like in terms of your like personal anecdote insight, are you, do you find that more founders like are like, yeah, I want to sell in, you know, XYZ years or when I hit XYZ revenue, or do you find that most of them are like, no, I want to hold on to this thing and ride it till the wheels fall off? It honestly, like, yeah, I wish I could say like, you know, most of them are like this. Um, but like, whenever we get to those conversations, like some founders, if they plateau, they're like, God, like, just get me on this plateau. Like, this is the worst position to be in, especially if you're going to sell. <laughs> because it's like, it really looks unattractive uh, unless somebody has like some inside knowledge of like how they can turn it around kind of thing. So um, yeah, like that's that's pretty common uh, where they're just like, oh, get me out of here. I want to like get some progress out of this. And then, yeah, for some of the ones that are like closer to like the eight, nine, 10, they're, they're thinking like, you know what, especially if they're bootstrapped, they're like, all right, it's about exit time. If we got two co-founders, maybe we could each get 10 mil each 20 mil, uh, and sail the sunset and make work optional. But yeah, I think like for a lot of founders, even when they're talking about it, I always coach them, like get to the next ladder in the rung. <laughs> <laughs> and like, what does that look like for you? Is it uh, financial independence? Is it it's something else? Uh, is it just getting this off of your back? And like, uh, some people are like, I just want a job. <laughs> this is hard. <laughs> it's like, okay. Um, but that's, that's a lot less common. Most founders want to just like level up in some way, whether that's move to more of an investing role, uh, move to just like their next startup or something else. Yeah, there's definitely mm. a big gap there where people are kind of putting everything in their own business in that type of founder versus kind of the founder who's like me and not to say I don't work, but I like to do as little, I like as little as possible needing to use up all my time because I don't equate time with accomplishment. I don't equate time with meeting objectives. And a lot of people kind of just say, okay, I can use all my time to meet objectives. And I don't look at things that way. And from a founder's perspective, that links directly to exiting, right? Because you can't sell a business that requires you to be working on it 60 hours a week. And so that's an essential element of thinking of that future plan and what you're doing with your yourself, your time, you know, or what you should be doing with it. For sure. So I guess like if a founder is looking to sell, like uh, I just tell them like, hey, you should talk to these guys get some ideas or <laughs> what's the best way to kind of collaborate? Yeah, you should definitely uh, send them over to us by an email introduction. And you could just say, Hey, like these guys are experts at preparing business for sale and selling businesses. Right. You should talk to them, even if it's just to get the bug in their ear about things they should be, uh, they should be planning for in the future because yeah. people very often too late, realize the very basic things you need to do when you sell business it's a you know it's like being an accountant it's a profession and there's these yeah. norms and standards and if you're like a software engineer founder or something you're not going to know those things um and people think like it's kind of like if you want to be your own person and sell your own house yourself or buy your house yourself without a broker yeah. it's just not how it works like there's a whole thing there that even though it kind of sounds simple i could sell my own house but yeah. it's just not how it works. And so, yeah, just you can just intro us by email or like any other way uh, that if you guys are having a meeting or something, we could join as well. Cool. No, that definitely sounds good. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, cool. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, we definitely love to kind of just meet people and, and see what's up and what's going on and, and start the ball in that conversation. And if it's if it's time down the line, like we have people come back to us nine months later and be like, oh, well, I have a deal now. Um, let's do this. And then we're like, oh, well, like, where have you been? <laughs> yes. For nine months. <laughs> cool, dude. <laughs> uh, Wes, hit us with a tip of the day. All right. So the main tip, this is all secret to product-led growth. It's grandiose and it makes sense when you hear it, but here it is. If you take nothing away to really master product ad growth, you have to believe this one statement, which is your user success will ultimately become your success. And what I mean by that is if you've ever signed up for any other software tool or anything else like that, that has a free option and you didn't get to value, 
nine times out of 10, if not all times, you probably didn't go back. You probably just deleted that app. So like getting users to value and having an incredible engaging experience for that free experience is the 80, 20 of it all. If you can master that, uh, you'll find a lot of the other pieces fit into place. So you gotta have the right model to do that. You gotta have, you know, great onboarding, all these other things to really make it work. But that is, if you take nothing else away, uh, is the most important. Fantastic. Well, Wes, thanks so much for joining us this week. Uh, I'm your host, Omid, here at the SaaS Buyers Club. Yeah, and thanks a lot. I appreciated your time. Uh, we got to cut it now uh, due to time concerns, but I uh, look forward to talking with you in the future. And uh, I was your co-host here with the SaaS Buyers Club. Awesome. Thanks, guys. This is fun. Likewise, Wes. Where can people find you? Yeah, just go to uh, productlight.com if you want to take that fun assessment. Uh, but then if you want to follow me on LinkedIn, I post every single day uh, a product <laughs> growth related tip. So yeah, you can find me at Wes Bush on LinkedIn. Awesome. Thanks everyone for joining us this week. See you next week.